It's going to be very exciting today, and we're going to have a lot of fun and hear a lot of great stories. And we're going to look behind the curtain of a making of a brilliant new album called Be Myself from Sheryl Crow and talk about a musical collaboration that's been going on for some 20 years. She has sold 35 million albums worldwide, nine-time Grammy Award winner. Please welcome Sheryl Crow. a multi-instrumentalist, a brilliant producer and songwriter, Mr. Jeff Trott. How did it feel to watch those videos? Ooh, like, uh, <laughs> like all the, um, the Grammy stuff, it's like um, worst dress list or, you know, oh my God, why was my hair like that? You know, you know how it is. Well, I can't wait to talk about this brilliant new record, but before we do, I really want to go way back and talk about both of you. Talk about your first musical memories. Something maybe in your childhood growing up, what was on the radio, what your parents were listening to. Can you recall? Um, well, I'll go first, because I actually vividly remember we had a powder blue Plymouth station wagon and, um, of course, no seatbelts. And I remember vividly sitting in the back of it and driving around town and singing Downtown by Petula Clark. <laughs> and um, just really being into it. And my parents were in a swing band, so they'd come home on the weekends and um, from gigs, and they'd play music until the wee hours of the morning, kind of just like what, what I do. And the three of us girls um, would sleep on the stairs on the other side of the living room so we could hear what was going on. And, you know, just it was always music, 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 music. And um, I think that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Jeff, what about you? Uh, let's see. Um, well, I had this weird Uncle Harold <laughs> who... Um, you can see why I love writing with him. He, um, <clears throat> he would say, you know, no, don't listen to the Beatles and Stones and all that crap your parents are listening to. You know, you need to, you need to listen to weird psychedelic music. And uh, so he was like, you know, giving me uh, like electric prunes and, you know, just all this really strange stuff, stuff that I can't even rem really remember. But he kind of made me think like, oh, there's, there's music aside from the radio. There's this other, you, know, you can get vinyl with all, this, all these bands that you kind of have to seek out and, and, uh, and I think that's where I kind of got a taste of like being, you know, what in, independent music was like. Um, but I also did like the radio too. I mean, like there was some great stuff on AM radio that just sounded, you know, amazing. Like, you know, like some of the like early Linda Ronstadt stuff. It just, you know, still sounds really great today. You know. Do you remember the first album you bought? Um, I remember the first album I owned was ABC uh, by the Jackson Five. <laughs> and then 26 years later, I went on the road with them. So you just, you never know how life's going to work. Jeff, do you remember the first album you bought? First album, um, I think it was, um, I think it was Crosby, Stills and Nash or something like that. I think, I, I don't know if I bought it. I can't remember if I bought it or my parents did. They, you know, because they were always like, Actually, that's the one, one thing they were pretty supportive of me. They knew that I really love music, and, and uh, so they were always kind of feeding me records and stuff like that, so I just kind of, you know, went with that. Was there an epiphany or a moment where you knew this is what you wanted to do? Um, wow. You know... Um, my mom was a piano teacher, and but she didn't teach us, and she we had six pianos in our house because she taught this method where they had group piano lessons. So she had a studio where there were like um, four pianos back to back, and then we had a grand in one room, and then we had another piano. And so we would practice, all three of us girls and my little brother, but my little brother wasn't really, um, he wasn't practicing yet, he was really little. And I remember her yelling from the kitchen, that's a B flat, Kathy, Karen, you're taking that too fast. And then her yelling, Cheryl, that's James Taylor. Or, you know, that's Elton John, that's not your lesson. And I could just always play by ear. <laughs> so, um, and then all of us went on to get our degree in classical uh, piano performance. And I just always loved pop music. And when I got in college, I started playing in bands. And I don't know, I just, I mean, I, if you picked up a yearbook 
from my high school, I would have been least likely to become a rock star, for sure. Um, I don't know, I think I was like a frog in a pot. I just, you know, it kept boiling and boiling, and then the next thing I knew, I was cooked. Is there a moment for you? Um, well, it's funny, my, my first instrument was uh, trumpet, and not really, almost by default, because my weird Uncle Harold had this trumpet, and he said, you know, you should play trumpet, you know, and I'm thinking, no, nah, that's not cool, I don't know, I don't want to play, no, 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 really, you'd be great, you know, so I played trumpet um, for about two years, and then I had this uh, recital, and, uh, uh, you know, I was warming up or doing something right before the recital, and uh, this kid came up and hit the bell, and it split open my lip, and so I'm like, I played the recital with like, you know, a bloody lip and all that stuff, but then I thought, okay, I think trumpet's a little too dangerous, you know, so I <laughs> picked up the guitar, which didn't seem as threatening. <laughs> well, we saw the stats and how many songs that you have both written together, and I mean, huge number one hits, timeless songs, some of the biggest songs of our generation. What makes this collaboration work? Well, we've actually written, I think it said 30 songs in 20 years, but we've written a ton of songs that you've never heard and you never will because we've made people <laughs> sign contracts. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that works, um, I don't know, I'm a little philosophical about why you wind up in your life with certain people. Sure. And um, so I feel like Jeff and I, I call him my musical husband. He's happily married, but just music-wise, we... Um, we just were in sync and f kind of found each other at a moment when the music experience for both of us had been kind of precarious and it was right kind of at the tail end of my first record. I think one of the things that, that works well for both of us is that we are, we are intrinsically similar in the way that we look at life. Um, I can safely say that Jeff is an artist in his own right. The stuff he writes on his own for me is very inspirational. It's not like what we do. It's, it's very much his own thing. Um, and I listen to it and I'm wowed by it, but it's not at all what we do together. There's something that we do together that falls together for whatever reason it does. We, we work best when we've spent time talking and then he picks up a guitar and I pick up a bass and we've got a couple of mics and it comes together, I think mainly out of an agreement of where our hearts are at and what it is that we're trying to just put out into the universe. And it's always been like that. Um, it's been more fun sometimes than it has been at other times. I think now that we're our age, it's been very liberating for both of us. I know for me, it's been liberating to not have to think about um, what's gonna get played at radio and trying to appeal to a demographic that is just clearly not gonna listen to a 50 year old. So in some ways, it's great to know that there are people out there that aren't, are also not gonna listen to music that's geared to 13 year old, that wanna hear music that is still in the old conventional um, structure of songwriting, that's not bound by six seconds of an attention span and repeating a hook and a, you know, all the things that go into factory music. So it's, it fits us great, because we're from the old school of you know, crafting and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um... I think our, the thing that we have together, it's, it, you know, I think it really started off as like just a friendship, you know. Um, I met Cheryl through other people, through Kevin Gilbert and Bill Bottrell, and, and uh, we instantly just became friends, and then we uh, were always uh, sort of sharing music that we were inspired by, what, whoever the latest, or, you know. Um, and I think, that sharing these, you know, sharing the stories, sharing other music, thoughts, you know, uh, philosophy and all that stuff, I think it just kind of, you know, seeped into the music that we did. And then like she was saying earlier, you know, we feel like a lot of times we get together, we don't feel like we're, you know, old folks. We feel like, we always just feel like we're starting a new adventure and it's, you know, it's really exciting. We don't know where it's gonna go. Um, we don't really put any limitations to what we're doing. I mean, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll write that 
crappy song, you know, and then hopefully that leads somewhere and, you know, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it has, it has actually, you know, right. And we, okay, this song, you know, it's, it's good, but it's like, it's, I don't know. I don't know about it. And then, and then maybe the next time that we get together, uh, it'll lead to something that's even better. And it's like, okay, well, how do we get closer to what, um, you know, what's really in our heart that's really speaking to us that we can connect to, not just playing, but like for Cheryl that, you know, she can, um, you know, like that she, she can believe every word and that the melody, even if you didn't know what the words were, that the melody kind of, you know, conveys that what you're trying to get across. Even if you didn't speak English, you would kind of, oh, yeah, it's, you know, about turmoil or it's about whatever it is, you know. Well, congratulations on Be Myself. The reviews are amazing. I'm going to read a few in a minute because I know you don't read reviews, so. I'm going to read it for I'll, you. I'm going to step into the back room. <laughs> <laughs> the I don't like is reviews. Yeah. The record really is great. And when you went in to make this record, I heard that you went back and sort of listened to your second and third album. Were you trying to capture something that was there then for this record? Well, um, did we specifically listen to... I guess we listened to a couple of things. I mean, my main objective when I got together with Jeff, Jeff had just moved to town, and Nashville's a pretty big place, but he moved like three minutes from my house, which was perfect. <laughs> if I could have had him move into my backyard, I probably would have. But um, So everything kind of fell together. I'd put out a country record, and I'd loved the, the process. I, I enjoyed writing with a lot of writers in Nashville, but I'd never really done that before. I'd never sat in a room with like two people. and um, it, it was... It was in t my intention to experience what that's like because there are great songwriters in Nashville. But what I came out of, of it with was a feeling of, um, wow, okay, I've tasted what music as commerce, I mean, I don't know. It just took me so far away from what I knew music to be that I, when Jeff moved to town, I, I said, hey, let's get together and let's just sit down and write because I just feel like, I feel like getting into the studio like we used to, like a couple of kids with just a big pot and just throwing stuff in there and seeing what kind of stew we get without any um, confines or any constructs and just see what we come up, up with. And in listening to the second record, I could, hear, I could hear my frustration about how well the first record did and how many people said, oh, did she even, was she even in the room? It was written by a bunch of guys. You know, there was all kinds of kind of negativity around that record after the, after the Grammys. Actually, after the Grammys, everything exploded, and then all of a sudden, I went from being really popular to being, like, most hated person on the planet. Mm -hmm. And part of that is overexposure. It, it's not the result of the Grammys or anything else. The, the Grammys actually changed my life in the most amazing ways. You know, if it hadn't been for the Grammys, we wouldn't have gone to South America. We wouldn't have gone to Russia. We wouldn't have... People wouldn't have known my music. It was before social media and just the power of um, your peers saying what you're doing is good, keep doing it, was monumental in a million ways. And um, it gave us, you know, it afforded us the ability to just keep going and keep going. And um, But by the time I got in to make the second record, um, I just wanted to make music and just enjoy that process. And you can hear it on the record. The record sounds really bratty. It was. It was, sounds very like, um, just, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's very committed to like rocking. Mm -hmm. So much so, so that we drove, drove the neighbors in the neighborhood, I mean, crazy with like, you know, windows open, no air conditioning and recording if it makes you happy like 900 times. <laughs> But so that was that record. The, the third record that we worked on in New York City was the Globe Sessions, and that came at the tail end of a really just a breakup that was just crushing me. And so a lot of that came out. Of, and so I think when you go into the studio, and if you're in the safety of people that are uh, facilitating your um, documenting your life, that. Um, you know that that's that's the gift that's the art and um i've always you know i've been really blessed to have jeff in my corner so much so that a lot of the times when we've written stuff i've gone off and written stuff by myself that's been a reflection of being able to just be 
open and, um, you know, uh, free to get it all out there. Well, you have this great chemistry together, so how does the writing process work? Do you walk in with an idea or a riff, or, and then it just goes from there? Well, I mean, it's a lot of different things. Sometimes it'll just start with a conversation. I'll just go over to Cheryl's, and we're having coffee, and we're just talking about, you know, this outrageous thing that happened or whatever. And then, um, and then we, we, you know, we'll pick up instruments and, and you know, I don't know, we just start playing, and then these things just kind of emit, and, and then we kind of both go on the journey. We don't really try to, you know, capture it right away, but then eventually it just starts to speak, and and then it, it you know, it may, I mean, especially on this last record, we really sat down and we discussed, after we kind of got the ideas together, um, we really wanted to make sure that there was some kind of underlying message, but not like a preachy thing. It was just sort of like a message, you know, from us or, you know, um, that really, you know, speaks uh, truth to what, like, we, what our lives are. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's really, you know, sometimes it'll be, you know, I think I even brought some sort of uh, this little recording of this this, this um, little you know, garage band, I was like, listen to this, Cheryl, this is so cool, it's just, it's so gritty, and it's like the people, it just sounds like they're having so much fun, and they're just banging on their guitars, and all this, and I'm like, I go, you know, let's, let's do something like that, you know, let's just, you know, that was, um, we do, we listen to a lot of music, and that makes it really fun, this, I, I think this record, too, um, we both have children, we both have two boys, um, we actually made this record between school drop-off <laughs> and dinner. Um, it was a really quick record. I think we, we, have a to, we had a total of about, about maybe three, four weeks on it, it was, and it was really fast. And I think part of it, too, is, um, as you guys know, there's a lot happening with all of us. There's a lot in the ether, and um, for me as a parent, there are certain things that are just blaring that are unavoidable um, as far as what to write about. And we, the first thing that we wrote on this record was a song called Alone in the Dark. And just the idea that you're raising kids and how difficult it is already to um, navigate your teens and the changes that you're going through and popularity or lack of popularity and bullying and all that. And then you have this gadget with you that's telling you that you're worthless or that you're not as popular or um, that you're getting messages that aren't, aren't related to facial expressions or empathy or whatever. And um, so there's a, for me, there's a lot of my working things out on this record. And a lot of the lyrics, um, typically what we've done is Jeff will have a great riff and I'll start playing a bass and we'll have a drum programmer or a great drummer. And then um, I'll start singing. And a lot of the lyrics came out in full like I, I've said it before, barfing out lyrics, but it really was kind of like that. And then going back and going, oh, wow, this is what this is about. And it was just the result of us sitting and talking about how, how to navigate life and still be led by your heart and by your conscience when you have this thing that is, we're so addicted to it. You know, I play shows. I played a show two nights ago where I watched a woman be lit up by her phone light and all the all the darkness out there and it was distracting to me I mean I couldn't I wanted to go over to her and say hey what you looking at you know who, who are you talking to you know um, who's not here that you're you, you know so um, so a lot of what's on the record is just observations about who we are becoming in our humanity you talk a lot about social media uh, on this record. I love the title track, Be Myself. If I can't be someone else, I might as well be myself. And it is a lot about, you know, the pressures of, of social media. And when you, you know, when you started out, both of you, we didn't have all of this, you know, as an artist, you got on the road and you got on your tour bus and you toured and there's so many more demands now. But with all the social media that's out there now, is it harder as an artist? I would say that some independent artists say, well, I can directly reach my fans, but it's almost like we don't have that sense of mystery anymore like we used to. Totally agree with you on that. I mean, before, 
uh, you know, you had to kind of seek out, you'd be interested in some band and then you'd want to know all these things. And then it wasn't like you weren't, you didn't know every little aspect of what they do or how they play or how they, you know. Um, so yeah, there was an air of mystery and that is kind of like gone. There's no mystery anymore. It's like everything is revealed, you know. Um, but I think that's, uh, you know, part of the beauty that you know we were trying to mm -hmm. to to get back you know but and 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 a lot of the songs kind of you know relate to that well, you know where does this you know where did that innocence go you know that we had or whatever that beautiful innocence you know i think my big beef with it is that not my big beef one of my big beefs and i'll i'll be honest with you i'm a complete and total dinosaur I rather enjoy keeping my head in the sand. Um, but I do, I mean, I do participate in it. Um, sometimes it's fun, but I also am a person, like you said, I don't read reviews. I can't, if I get on there and read too much stuff, there are as many people who have been liberated with the anonymity that they have to be able to say just really ugly things. And that makes me feel bad about humanity at large. Um, so I am, you know, I'm cautious about it. Um, but I guess the thing that concerns me more than anything, and you guys are in the music industry, and some of you have been around long enough to re remember when music was what, how you got turned on to the person. And now we're building up these brands that are so much bigger than our music. And the objective is to make your brand so big that, so that people will want to buy your music. And I guess what I'm desiring is that we get back to a place where music is given the opportunity to to have an effect on us, um, so that it's not associated with a beautiful picture of somebody who's, you know, on their social media. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm really old-fashioned that way, but I have seen music really make a difference in people's lives, and I've had people come up to me and say, "This song or this record really got me through some hard times." And I guess it's my my desire that we um, in some way, some form of, or fashion, try to help, especially young people who are growing up in this, get turned on to music um, without, oh, in, the, in a social experience where there, there are no gadgets and you're just listening or you're, you know, um, where music can still have the power that I believe it still has. I think I heard that phrase, we're so connected, yet we're so disconnected, and it's so hard to be present. And I'm sure that having children for both of you has made you really be more present and in the moment. Well, and I know Jeff and I have talked about this, but we, um, I, I really have, I keep my phone on silent, and I don't check it, and I'm not on it when I have my kids. Now, that's just me, and I am older, so I'm able to do that without the stress. But it took me a minute, you know, because there is that thing when you're just sitting there, it's just like you just want to kind of like check and see what's going on, I'm gonna check on CNN, I'm gonna check my eBay, you know. And um, it's just good to be present, and it's an exercise now. Like in the old days, being present was something that you did because it was natural. Now it's an exercise in um, being connected, having emo an emotion, a reaction, empathy, compassion, all that sort of stuff, so. <laughs> Sorry, I get on my soapbox. You mentioned being a little distracted, though, you know, watching people in the audience because, you know, people want to take video or they want to take photos or whatever. But I can remember when, you know, it was just all about the music and you were just mesmerized by the music. And now it seems like sometimes you go to a show and it's a little bit more of a social scene. So it's got to be tough as an artist, though, when you're on stage and seeing those distractions. It's weird. <laughs> I'm sorry. It is weird. You know, um... Any given night, um, I mean, I know you know it, I know Peter and Tim both know it, but, and Chuck Lavelle, I know you know it. I went to a Rolling Stones concert, and there was a very famous band member in a band in Nashville who, when Mick was out on the catwalk, the whole time he was, like, getting a selfie with Mick. And I'm like, listen, it's Mick Jagger! You're missing him! <laughs> you know, um, I'm just like, I mean, that's just, it's the, it's the new reality, you know, of playing to people's cell phones. And it is what it is, and I know that people love it, and I don't want to deprive them of that experience. But I also think that there's something really beautiful about connecting with people's faces and their eyes and getting a sense of this, this tiny moment that we share on the planet, you know. Yeah, it's also like, um, yeah, that's great. 
also the way we listen is, you know, it's changed and, and, you know, there's definitely some benefits of being able to have access to so many new music that you would never... Point, have. counterpoint. Jane, you ignorant slut. Yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, it is true. Keep no, going. You're okay. on a good track. But, but where, where I was going with it is um, and back in the old days, we had these <laughs> vinyl records and... The thing, the thing that I liked about that, although the, it's a different kind of sharing, but you'd get a record, you know, at a store, and you had this like the big artwork and everything, and you'd pull it out you and you smell it. It's the vinyl. It just has this like experience, and uh, and you share it with people, and you sit around, and you listen to it, and you go, oh yeah, I really like this thing. And it's it's not that you can't do that anymore, but everyone is so. It's so insular. It's like, oh, my little world, and my I'm going to control my little world. But it is nice when somebody has like some some weird old like you know French you know new wave record or something like that, and they put it on and it's crackling. And there's something you know I don't know something that I really enjoy about that. Um, fortunately, uh, you know, it seems like vinyl's really making a a pretty big comeback, and a lot of new bands that I see will, uh, you know, maybe they're not making any, you know, a lot of royalties, so they're selling, you know, their vinyl records at their shows and making, you know, a, a nice little, keep keeping the their music alive by being able to uh, sell vinyl records, as, you know, like a limited pressing of their records. And then, uh, so there's a whole scene of people picking up on that. I think in the UK, it really kind of took off big time. I mean, not with the, not with the dinosaurs like us, but like with the young, younger generation, it really picked up on that, and it's always it's turned into like clicks and stuff. Um, but uh, but anyways, vinyl and weed. Vinyl and weed. That's the answer to the, the music industry's problems. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, you guys were. Cheryl writing. Crow quoted. <laughs> Did you get that? Yeah. This is all being filmed, by the way. Um, I was just kidding. This is all going to be on social media right after we get out of here, too. One more thing about social media, because I want to talk about the first single, Halfway There. And obviously, you guys were writing this record during a you know, tumultuous time in the country. But, um, Cheryl, you said that we've learned to be a society without empathy and without compassion. And a lot of that is about people being able to hide behind social media and you know, spewing hatred, and it's awful because they're not accountable, and they will never be accountable. That's a tough thing to have to swallow. Yeah, it's a, um, yeah, I mean, I, I do worry, you know. Um, I worry. I can't help it. I mean, I have little ones. Um, you know, I guess if I were, you know, if I had grandkids, and I, I don't know. I have, I have a seven-year-old, so I worry about what the future looks like for he and his brother because... Um, you know, even when we see the news and um, kids encouraging other kids to kill themselves without having the actual experience of sitting with them and, and realizing that this person is, um, you know, a live spirit that God created and is, is valuable simply by the fact that he exists. Um, the fact that you can say something on social media and or texting or whatever and not have that response. I mean, I've read some really, really ugly stuff about myself, which was one of the reasons I put it away, that that hurt my feelings really badly. And if that was the objective, well, then you've succeeded. But it's not the best of us. I mean, that isn't who we are. We weren't born that way. That is a learned and accepted behavior that for some reason increases the endorphin rush. And it, it isn't a part of that pure spirit that came in and became um, you know, a living, breathing human being, adult. And, um, I, and I do worry about it. I worry about the hate rhetoric that has taken over in this country. I worry about whether we're gonna be able to get back to a place where we do not accept that as being um, you know, not only ethical, but um, just accepted in society. I worry about the way we speak to each other. And that really, in this particular past election, I felt like it had become so heightened that not only was it 
heightened, but it was it became accepted. And then it's it's really, I think, now infiltrated the way we look at each other in our differences. You know, I saw this statistic the other day that said something about how um, used to in the old days, and I don't know what the actual statistic was, but if, you're, if your son married uh, a girl who was uh, uh, in the other party, that the parents, it was just not, accept, it's not accepted now. It would be a real, really hard problem for you to ever accept that person's politics. And in the old days, whatever the old days were, um, you know, it, that wasn't a big deal. You found your your halfway point. You worked together. You know, you found where you were similar, and you dealt with it. And now it's just, I feel like there's is that the you know, joy is fighting with hate on a daily basis, and we just you know, if if it's not intrinsic, then we got to teach it and we got to model it. So, and that's that's where that song came from. I love that, that you're saying we should have a dialogue, basically, which is brilliant that you were able to put that in a song. This album rocks, and I want to talk to you specifically because I know we were talking last night about the guitar sounds and the horns and everything else, and I love that because I don't think anybody's rocking anymore, and it kills me, but you always bring the rock back, Cheryl. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, we were talking about this. Um, you know, Cheryl and I have always... Uh, try to do this thing where, you know, we, well, we're playing acoustic guitars, writing songs and stuff like that, but we didn't want to like just write like delicate folk songs or whatever. We want to really rock with an acoustic guitar though, you know, so rocking softly? No, not really. <laughs> but Soft rock. Soft rock. Um, but, uh, but we, um, so we always kind of start off, you know, on acoustic instruments and then a, go to electric um but we were both really craving you know finding that bratty thing and um and we're thinking oh, yeah let's break out the electrics um and i think there was a moment where uh you know i had this acoustic guitar mic'd up with a really beautiful german microphone and and um and we're like let's rock and then i i, I was too lazy to reach over and grab the electric guitar so I just plugged my acoustic guitar into my pedal board into an amp and then cranked it up and it had such a it made us all excited it's like wow there's all this like gnarly noise coming out and it made us like kind of you know take a different approach to what we were doing you know brought this like kind of fun joy uh, and uh and so we recorded a lot of songs with acoustic guitar into an amp, and eventually the uh, the mic'd channel, you know, the nice clean acoustic guitar channel, just kept getting turned down, lower, lower. And finally, it was just like, let's just go with the amp. So a lot of the, a few of the the songs uh, that sound like they're an electric guitar are actually an acoustic guitar, just really overdriven. So. I don't know. We had a song on the record called uh, Heartbeat Away, which basically, it's like the loud, it sounds like Led Zeppelin, and basically it's a, an acoustic through an amp, a bass, and then drums down in the, um, I have a big saloon. They're just, it just sounds like Bonham. And it's just, it's like three or four instruments, but it sounds like. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we were really getting off on that. And, you know, that kind of, I mean, we had never really done a really full-on rock thing, you know, that was like a headbanger almost thing, you know. But, I mean, we're not like real metal heads or anything like that. But, um, but yeah, it was really fun to do. And the thing is, it's like Cheryl can really bring it. I mean, she can really, you know, like... She can really belt it out when she wants to, you know, so that's kind of cool. That was fun for and man, me. after you drop your kids off in the morning at <laughs> yeah. school, you really want to bring it. Yeah. <laughs> See you, <ya>, kids. <clears throat> All right, let's do it. <laughs> you guys brought back, um, you said maybe a missing piece, and that was someone you had worked with before, the legendary mixer engineer, Chad Blake. How did that come about? That was a cool story how you found him too, Cheryl. Um, well, we, um, we, we, we did like three days one week and recorded like five or six songs. And the way we, we write is we will write it and then we'll overdub like, oh, let's make a great demo. And then the demo winds up being on the record. 
But um, after like three or four sessions of doing that, we're like, what is missing from this? Anything like, wait, let's finish it. What are we going to do? And both of us like, let's get Chad Blake. We'd worked with him on the early stuff. And Chad is, is, is an artist in his own right. He's done a ton of, he works at Real World. He's, world. He's done a lot of mixing, a lot of engineering. He does the black keys. He, I mean, he does a lot of things that you guys would know he, he's done and really talented. So... Um, I knew he lived in Europe. I wasn't sure if he still lived in Wales or, or in Bath. He'd moved to Wales, and I called him. Actually, I sent him an email, and I said, this is a long shot, but would you? we want you to work on this record. Is there any way you'd come to Nashville? And he emailed me right back saying, when and, I'll, when and yes. So um, so I did. I called him, actually, and he answered. I was T-Doc like this. And I said, oh, my gosh, did I wake you up? He'd had throat cancer uh, the year before. And so... Um, and he's doing great, but you know, all it's just interesting when you've been doing it. We've been working together for twenty something years, and um, Chad and I actually have been working together for probably seventeen or eighteen. And I hadn't seen him in maybe fifteen years, so you know, it's just interesting when life is life is what it is. You know, you marry, you divorce, you have kids, you adopt kids, you get cancer, uh, you beat cancer, you. Uh, I mean, it's just you lose people. It's it is what it is, and when you get back together, <clears throat> particularly in a space like um, what what we had going on, it just felt like a giant celebration of life. Like, gosh, we're so lucky, and it was like being kids. Yeah, well, I know when you asked Chad to come out, you know, we were, it was kind of a gamble. It's like, <laughs> oh, he's all the way over in Wales, and, you know, would he have actually do that? Would he? And um, I think... I think didn't he like uh, I, uh, I'll be there, but you know I have one stipulation: you have to have a keg of Guinness for waiting for me. So we had this little ritual. Uh, I mean, we weren't like you know sitting around getting hammered and recording all that. Would have been more most wrong. of the time we weren't. Mo yeah, no, I'm but we had, at at about five o'clock in the afternoon after we had been uh, recording a bunch and stuff, we'd have our little Guinness break. And we'd just have one, and we'd just sit there and sip it. And it was just like the best ritual. It was like it kind of really, you know, brought us together and stuff. But uh, I thought that was kind of funny that he demanded a, a keg of Guinness there. Very demanding. Very demanding. What's it like recording in Cheryl's barn, though? That's a cool place. Um, yeah, it is. It's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you have you know, I don't know, like nine or ten horses underneath you and they're clopping around and all this stuff. And you're, I mean, fortunately, they they insulated this, this uh, the barn and all that stuff. So, I mean, if you open the door from the studio, you can hear, you know, horses moving <laughs> around. And, and it's great. And it's, uh, it's totally, it's really, I don't know, it's it's a pretty magical place, you know. I mean, I've always... I feel like a little kid when I'm there. I'm like, oh, there's horses and there's guitars and you know, <laughs> horses so and guitars. horses and guitars. But yeah, it's it's a pretty cool place. It kind of you know you can make it into whatever you want it to. We, I think we had the studio set up one way, and then Chad came in and he goes, hey, can I, you know, rearrange the whole studio? And we're like, oh, yeah, you know. And so he actually kind of you know turned it into a different space and uh that's the cool thing about that having your own studio you can you know turn it into whatever you want it to be you know and for me the nice thing too is that um my kids um they they've grown up on tour buses and stuff and i think their association with what i do is um being out on stage and jumping around and singing and clapping and all that you know people clapping and it just looks like a lot of fun but this is the first time that my kids ever got to see the work that goes into making a record, um, and that it is work, and it is an occupation, and they, they came in, and they were much more interested in it than they have been ever. Like, they didn't, I don't think they really knew how music was made, because they haven't been a part of it. You know, they, they'd come home from school, and they'd come up and hang out. In fact, they brought their friends a couple of times, and Chad showed them how to move knobs, and they got to sing on the record on this song called Roller Skate. But I think they now they take it a little more seriously, and they actually like the music more because they they got to hear it 
coming together and they understand that, you know, work is serious and it's something that you, you put a lot of hours on uh, into and it may not, you know, you may not wind up with what you started out with, but you stick with it, you know, so that was a good thing. I love that they're on the record. Do they have a favorite song on the album? Oh yeah, Roller Skate. <laughs> yes. They, there were five boys and they named themselves the Five Bucks. <laughs> and they got paid five bucks, so each of them. A few years away from being in a band, Cheryl. That's but... right, the Crow Bros. <laughs> I do want to read a few reviews because, you know, you make music and you kind of put it out in the universe and you never know what's going to happen, but um, the record's just getting incredible reviews. And I wanted to read a few and kind of get your take and let me know what you think. Rolling Stone, her excellent Be Myself is her toughest and best in a decade, a full-blown return to her fierce rock queen glory. I love that. New York Times, sometimes the comfort zone is where a musician belongs. That's the charm of Be Myself, Sheryl Crow's pointedly titled new album, which gleefully and unabashedly returns to the sound of her hit albums from the 90s. And this just goes on and on and on. I wanted to read them because I know you said that you don't like reading reviews, but congratulations. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, also want to read something else because, you know, since being in Nashville, you have influenced a lot of new artists, you know, male and female, and uh, a couple of female artists like Cam and Kelsey Ballerini, who's a new country artist that has been sort of a breakout over the last two years, and she said something that I thought was really poignant about you and your career that sort of sums it up, and Jeff, you can comment on this. She's one of those artists, super few and far between, that aren't defined by a genre. She's indie, and she's country, and she's pop, all at the same time, and that's never even been questioned, because she just makes timeless music that fits in everywhere. I think that's a really important observation, that you are one of the few successful cross-genre artists, and that your music is timeless. And I think coming from a young artist to say that is just amazing. That is very nice. That's very nice. I, I second that. That's, That's very nice. Jeff, you've talked about, you know, Cheryl having an honest voice and how important that is to convey the emotion of a lyric. And it, it is. And as a producer, that means so much because, you know, you can sing a song, but you can actually know how to deliver a song. And you've been able to find that in Cheryl all these years. Yeah, I always, I always thought that um, Cheryl could read the back of a cereal box and read the ingredients and it would sound really important, you know, on a song, but... Uh, Corn syrup. Syrup. <laughs> Artificial flavoring. Um, yeah, I think... five. <laughs> um, yeah, but she... Uh, well, I think there's, you know, uh, there have been singers like Frank Sinatra where they just take every single word and they put so much into just that each word and um, and the way they phrase it and you know w with their emphasis on with the words that you want to poke out and all that stuff and she pays a lot of attention to all of that and and that was actually the other um, reason why we spent so much time with um, each song and the lyrics and exactly you know is this coming through is this really um, you know, do you really believe, is that something that you really believe, um, or, you know, and, uh, and I think that's the, that's the thing that, you know, when I hear the songs, you know, as, even as a, you know, if I stand back from it and try to be objective to listening to stuff that we've done, and I hear her voice, it's, I feel like she's just speaking to me, like just in the room, like we are sitting here and not reading it off of an iPhone or a, you know, a lyric sheet. So, I mean, I think that's something that is, is great. It's a real testament to what, you know, you, you as an artist and, and you're just, you know, you really, you really uh, sing about what you know and what you believe. So I, it just comes across as, you know, so genuine, you know. Oh, thanks. So you're playing Chastain tonight. How has it been playing these new songs out live? Um, it's been great. You know, um, we started out this whole tour playing at the Troubadour in L.A., and that was really fun. And um, I th I'm, the record hadn't even come out, and you can kind of tell when you play new stuff if you're losing people or... And 
almost everything that we were playing, uh, people were trying to sing by the second chorus. And we, I mean, we still write conventional choruses and, um, and that's always fun to see. And it's been really, I think, I, I don't really know. I mean, I don't know why it is, but this record has felt different to me. Um, maybe because the conviction and the joy I feel in it um, is translating, it, I don't know. I, I, but it just feels great. It feels very, like we've had people staying till the, you know, till the, after the second encore and people not leaving and on their feet. And that's been great, particularly for somebody, I mean, I've been doing it for 20, well, since 1991. So it's, it's great to feel like people are still, you know, they're still, they love hearing hits, but they're also cool to hear new stuff. And this particular record seems to be translating so well. In fact, I called Jeff and said, let's do an EP to finish, you know, to, to follow this up. So we're going to do that in July. That's Ow. it. You heard it here first. That's great. Yeah. Honestly, and you can hear, and I know that you, ca you have a lot of heavy topics on this record, but there's a lightness about that record, and you can really feel the joy that you're talking about. Yeah, you know, I, I just think it's an amazing time to be an artist. It's, so, it's such a compelling time, because there's just so much to write about. There's just so much in the ether, and... Um, uh, it's just endless, you know. Um, I, I really love I love this moment in my artistic life because I feel so energized by just having the opportunity to write about what we're all thinking about, you know, what we're all experiencing and what we're all looking at and what we're concerned about and what we love and what we're um, celebrating and just everything, you know. I look out at audiences now, and this is the difference between now and... 25 years ago, um, I see every different kind of face you could possibly see. I see uh, same-sex couples. I see uh, mixed couples. I see moms and their kids. I see dads and their buddies. I mean, it's just, it looks so different. It looks like what America looks like now. And um, there's something life-affirming about that for me, that people are coming as who they are, and they're together, and they're listening to music. And this is what I feel like is the best of us, where they come peacefully, they are excited about music, and okay, they've got their phones there, but at least they're, you know, <laughs> trying to capture it, and you know, hey, I was here, and um, so, I, I just, you know, that, that makes it, you know, it makes it, it makes it feel good. We might have uh, time for one or two questions because I know we have a lot of people in this room who respect both of you. But before we do, I want to ask about the collaboration record that you've been working on that you've talked about because you did have a relationship with, uh, with Johnny Cash and there's a song that you wrote that you've been able to get the audio from Johnny Cash. Can you just mm -hmm. tell that quick story? Yeah, well, um, after I completed the country record, I called Steve Jordan and said, look, I just, well, it started, we did a 40th anniversary for the Austin City Limits, and Chris Christopherson was on it, and I've known Chris since 19, uh, I guess 1994, and um, have done lots of collaborations with him through the years, and so he, in the past few years, has stopped making memories for whatever reason, whether it's... Limes, or I'm not sure exactly what the diagnosis is, but on this particular gig, his wife Lisa asked me if I would be a part of helping him uh, re record some of his songs so that they would own the masters. Um, it's not atypical for somebody to lose their masters along the way to publishing or to however it works, so he, didn't, he doesn't own his masters. So we went in and recorded like seven or eight songs, and then I started feeling like, God, you know, we're all getting older. Um, this was right before Bobby Keys passed and then Ian McLegan and I just started feeling like, you know, there's so many people I've loved and I've collaborated with through the years, but I've never had them come collaborate with me. And so I called Chris and I said, I called Lisa and said, would Chris come record? And she's like, in a second. So he came and recorded. And so that became the beginning of my just calling people that I love and I've known forever and I've had the great fortune of working with from Stevie Nicks to Don Henley um, to Keith Richards. Um, so Johnny is somebody that right before he passed, he, um, 
he asked me to sing at his wife's wedding, and then after that, he said, I have this song that you wrote, and I want to record it. And so that was just a colossal blessing. And years later, I called Rick Rubin and said, would you be okay if we combined our, our version of it? And he said, absolutely. So I called John Carter, his family, and they sent me his demo version. I mean, his, yeah, his demo vocal. And we just recreated the song with a completely different mood, really um, inspired by what's happening in the world today. Um, so it has a different weight, and man, it'll rip your heart out. Oh, so, it just gives you chills. I mean, uh, Cheryl played it for me, and I know the, the original, mm -hmm. because I played on it with her years ago, but to hear Johnny Cash's voice, and, that, and he's one of those, or he was one of those singers that paid attention to the meaning of a song and every, you know, the deep meaning behind every word and all that. And to hear his voice, I mean, the song was just stripped down to, I think, just piano, piano. And, and his voice and your voice. And, uh, and it gave me chills. I mean, I really, I had like the hairs on my arm were like standing up because it was so chilling hearing his voice. And then the words, the meaning of the words were just hitting me like I had never heard the song before. It was just incredible. He is interesting. I mean, this is just a side note, but a, a testament to who he was. And I think he, you know, one of the most, one of the greatest American artists, one of the greatest Americans, um, and really, I think in so many ways illustrated the fragility of all of the humanity in all of us. You know, he, he let all of his flaws hang out, and he talked about his struggles with drug addiction and alcoholism. He talked about his finding... Jesus Christ, and just, I mean, he just was a great man who was larger than life, but at the same time gave us permission to be human. But when he did the song, he he wanted to know about every line, and um, I mean, he just grilled me, and he's just like, I, this is going to be the most important song I've recorded in years, and then he passed a couple months later after he recorded it. And I told Rick about it, and Rick held on to it until many albums later, but I kept saying, he, you know, this was going to be the cornerstone or whatever. But it actually wound up working out fine because I think it still has mm -hmm. a life and I think he would be really proud with what's going on in the world to have his voice singing the words that meant to a lot to him at the time. So, Thank you for sharing anyway, that story too. Yeah, he's I, amazing man. We look forward to hearing that record. Do we have um, one or two questions from the audience? Raise your hand. <laughs> we did so well covering everything. That was this the... Uh, Hold on. Melissa Love. Thank you. Hi. I'm a music supervisor. I work with a lot of clearance and licensing projects. So I wondered about your process on your side of the fence. And can you tell us about how involved you get when you receive a request to use your song in an audiovisual production? Um, have you mentioned being overexposed, you know, artists feeling that way. Do you ever feel overexposed and maybe want to pull back, not allow a song to be used? Maybe you don't like the ethic of a production. Just, I'd, like to, I'd love to hear what goes through your head when you see these requests. Well, it's funny because when I got my first record came out in 1993, and I would write and record, and the record I will say, just you need to go away for a little while. And then we'll put something out. You need to go away. You need to go away. Now you cannot be, there is no overexposure. I mean, the more of you that is out every day, all day long, pictures, new footage, live behind the, you know, it's just constant promotion, 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 it's most social media. And that, that's, that goes against my grain because I'm just like a really whoa, 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 private person. But with regard to music, you know, I feel like um, any opportunity for music to be heard now is great because um, it works so so differently in the record industry with regard to promotion. Like it's not, the dollars for promotion don't exist like what they used to. So you really do rely on social media, all the Facebook lives, all that stuff. And to get your music heard, not just your speaking voice, but your music heard, it's a gift. I mean, it's like manna from heaven to get your stuff licensed um, I mean, I, I do draw the line if there line if there are things that like if it's going to be used in a porn movie or something like that. You know, I probably would say maybe not this time, but um, <laughs> but and, and you know, and um, an, another amazing thing which we haven't been asked to do it in a long time, but I you know, writing for a movie is just 
that's like the greatest, funnest thing for me. You know, I, I love writing four movies and four projects. That's, that's a blast. So I think we have one more. Yeah, we do. Diane Durrett. Hey, Cheryl, thank you for being here. Um, vocally, how do you uh, just keep your voice strong and, uh, you know, doing so many shows back to back? Um, I, you know, it's funny, I did an interview about um, Greg Allman the other day, and I worked with him, one of my earliest tours, I was on the Horde tour, and we were like the newbies. And I'd grown up listening to the Allman Brothers, and I remember being on his bus once, and this is a guy who lived pretty hard. Um, and we have the great Chuck Lavelle who can attest to how f just, I mean, he was, he and his brother, I mean, they were just chosen. I mean, there's, there's no mistake as to why they were amazing and they let, they just moved all of us with their spirits and their voices. But I asked him, I said, how do you do that every night? And, um, he said, sleep. That's the only thing that will protect your voice is sleep. And I do... I do sleep. Um, I don't. Um, I don't really. I don't smoke. I don't do a lot of drinking. Like I have a beer before I go on, and that's about it. I'm. I'm pretty rock and roll. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, we do. Sometimes we'll do six nights in a row, and I just I have to get a good night's sleep, and then sometimes I just have to rest in the afternoon. So it's kind of boring. I can just say from someone that I've known since through the 90s when I worked at 99X, you're just such a pleasure to work with, not only your professionalism, but your artistry, and it's, this has been an honor, and it's been so great getting to know you, Jeff, and hearing your story, and welcome to, I'm glad you moved to Thank Nashville, you. you're going to be very busy. He's, in a, he's a brilliant songwriter as well, so you're going to be hearing more from Jeff. But yes. thank you so much for sharing these stories and kind of giving us a behind-the-scenes look at Be Myself. The record is fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I want to I want to say thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, thank so much. you. My and goodness. Thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. We'll see you tonight. And, and Leslie Fram, thank you, Jeff Leslie. Trott, and Cheryl Crow, thank you so much.